Hello and welcome to your weekly Ask Show. If you want us to feature your questions on the show, then use hashtag AskGMBintech down in the comments below and we'll try and answer it for you. Now, let's get started straight away. I've got question number one from Andrew Bay here. He said, I'm a roadie who recently started mountain biking. What are the characteristics of saddles that I should be looking for in mountain biking other than seat bone width? Are there any differences with road ones? And could I ride my road saddle that I have ridden for years? Um, okay, so you've already mentioned sit bone width, which is great, you're buying saddles that fit you. Um, you might also be familiar with road saddles having um, different positions. So you've got commuter ones, you've got sportif ones, and you've got race ones. And usually they're saddles that are trying to relieve pressure points dependent on your position. So a race saddle, you might be more far forward in the drops, so pressure is in different place to if you're a commuter and more upright. So in mountain biking, we have a similar thing. So an enduro style mountain bike saddle might be slightly different to a racy XC saddle. So you might want to take that into account when you're thinking about what saddle you want to go for and if your road saddle is suitable um, for the style of riding you're doing now. But also, um, usually the materials are a bit different with a mountain bike saddle. The foam and the cover might be a little bit more durable, but also the seat rails will be a slightly tougher material, shall we say. So if your road saddle has carbon rails, for example, if you're doing XC, that might be fine, but if you're doing enduro or something that requires a bit more harder impact on your saddle, uh, then maybe a steel or not carbon would be more durable. Um, but the short answer is why not try your saddle and see if it works out for you, uh, see if the position matches up and then go from there. Next up, Russ Johnston said, are there any advantages and or disadvantages to running different tire whips? For example, wider on the front uh, than on the back. Um, not really, I would say. I know roadies do this for aerodynamic properties, uh, but I don't think we really need to worry about that too much. Um, I would say some people go for a fatter tire on the front sometimes to um, have better damping impact qualities, uh, but also a wider tire means more contact patch, which means more traction, which you do want on the front. Um, but people won't go bigger on the back just because a bigger tire might be heavier and therefore it's more rolling weight. So it might feel a bit slower or draggier from pedaling. But honestly, there isn't any real benefit to running two different sizes. Um, it might just be that it's a struggle to get two sizes these days with stock issues um, and you just want to run whatever you can get hold of. Um, so short answer, no, not really. <laughs> okay, so Tim Sadler said, just looking at the insane jumps at Darkfest got me thinking about the world record attempt by Nathan Rennie and Jason Rennie, uh, who jumped 130 foot at Landegla on a Kona stab. Is it only a matter of time before one of the new school riders hits something bigger? Would new school riders be more suitable uh, sorry, new school bikes be more suitable for such big jumps. Um, yeah, I guess they probably would be more suitable than an old Kona stab. Uh, they might be a bit stronger these days, suspension's a bit better. Um, whether they're gonna go and get a record, I don't know. I mean, we're already seeing bigger jumps in Red Bull Rampage. Um, they're doing 70 footers with a trick, you know? So obviously the progression in bikes has allowed them to progress the jumps in their sport. Um, whether that means they can then go for a record or not, I don't know, it, it just takes guts. Um, but yeah, definitely the progression of bikes has certainly enabled people to do some crazier stuff, um, but there were still some crazy guys back in the old days that I guess we're missing now. <laughs> But yeah, like to see a record go again. So EH2 Brutus has asked, 
I have a SRAM GX1 rear derailleur and a SRAM 10 to 42 tooth XD cassette. The cassette needs to be replaced. Could I replace it with a 1046 tooth cassette? Um, short answer is no, sorry. Um, I did check the SRAM website and they only, the derailleur only allows for a maximum of 42. Uh, so you can't use a bigger cassette. Um, the problem is if the cassette is bigger, it might get too close to your upper jockey wheel and they might entangle or you know you might have some issues there with your chain line. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to go bigger then you're going to have to look at maybe upgrading your derailleur. Um, for anyone else out there who has a similar issue if you wanted a bigger cassette and your derailleur allows it then all you need to do is make sure when you put the new bigger cassette on there that if you have a line it's lined up to your bigger cassette so you're going to need to play with the B screw which is out here on its own the lonely one and that will adjust the distance that this moves up and down to make sure it's not going to get tangled up with your cassette. Uh, next up we've got Johnny Medge RVA Thanks for keeping the vids coming, it's all right. Uh, I want to switch from resin to metallic brake pads. My rotor accepts both. Um, do I need to lightly sand the rotor before bedding in the metallic pads? And if I want to switch back to metallic, do I need to sand the rotors again? Um, this is not commonly done to sand your rotors every time you change pads. I don't, I don't often see a problem with that. Um, with changing them without sanding. Sanding is usually left to if there is a problem. So if you've gorged your disc or you, you scorn it or uh, if it needs resurfacing, then you'll sand it. Um, but if you're doing it by hand, you won't get a very smooth finish, which you want. Um, so it's kind of not really recommended unless you're good at it or um, you're a professional who knows how to resurface. A disc so I would say no don't sand it unless you absolutely have to just give it a try um, but make sure you bed those pads in properly uh, get them all nice and heated up on a long fire road descent um, so that they start to grab when you change your pads over and you've got new ones in there next up our question from Gij Saman hope I'm pronouncing that right uh, my dad and I finished our new shed. We are going to hang our bikes vertically. Should we hang it from the front wheel or the rear wheel? What is better for suspension? Um, so I see what you're saying because if you can get your forks to be slightly upside down, excuse me, um, then the oil in your lowers can roll to your seals and effectively re-lubricate your seals, which is, which is good. Um, so hanging it by the front wheel so that they are in that downward position might be a good idea. Um, but it's not necessarily good or bad for hanging your wheel either way, I would say. Um, but I do know that there are some brakes out there that don't like being upside down. I've definitely had some bikes where I've put them upside down and got on the bike and they kind of don't work. So my advice to you is to do whatever way up you want, but check your brakes for a while, for a couple of weeks afterwards to make sure they do actually still work and that your brakes aren't affected by being upside down. So. Tal Luel, how come Presta valves are still a thing in mountain biking and cycling in general when the Schrader is good enough for cars, trucks, aeroplanes and all the suspension components? Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. So the Presta valve came out for roadies um, because they were going for narrower rims and they wanted a narrower valve to get through. And we've basically taken that on in the mountain biking world and we've stuck with it. Um, and they can be a bit flimsy, I get what you're saying, um, but they also have some benefits to them. You know, you can screw them in and tighten them up, which you can't with Schrader. Um, you can easily let out a bit of PSI if you want to with your finger. Um, 
in your tires. You can also unscrew the cores and put sealant in them, which you can't with Schrader. And on the matter of tubeless, I don't think anyone's doing Schrader tubeless valves at the moment. So that might be a bit difficult too. Um, but you know, I, I think the industry is also getting a little bit frustrated with Presto at the moment. And there's a lot of people out there trying to make new versions, some high flow valves, and then there's sh uh, specialized Fillmore as well. They're trying to make a better product. So I think if you hate them, then there are some changes to come, but I would say don't hate them too much. They actually do a really good job right now. So yeah, I don't hate them. So Jedler or Jedlaw MTB, how come on higher end modern bikes uh, that come with one by on the shifter lever, it doesn't show what gear you're in, uh, but older entry level bikes with three by, two by um, show what gear you're in? Is it because it's easier for beginners? Yeah, probably. Um, I would also say that it's quite difficult to know where you are in the range of gears when you have a front derailleur as well. Um, and there's always that difficulty that you don't want a chain to be in big at the front and big at the back. And it's hard to know where you are without looking down, which is obviously has its drawbacks with balance and knowing when you go in. Um, so I think indicators were there just so that you know where you are in the range of gears and you don't overlap. Um, but obviously it is easier for beginners. Um, they don't want to be looking down and they don't have that kind of feel um, of where they are like an experienced biker would. Um, also with one by, you're not gonna have that overlap. You're not gonna be worried about going into big, big. Um, you'll feel whether the gear is easy for you or not and you've literally just got a range which you can move up and move down and you don't really need to see where you are to know whether it's a good gear or not. Um, so that's why I think you probably don't have indicators on one by, but I bet someone is doing an aftermarket version if you wanted to add that to your shifters. But that's all my questions for today and that's all we've got time for. But if you have any questions of your own that you want us to feature, do use hashtag AskGMBNTech down in the comments below and we'll try and get back to you.